In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. Amen. Just want to give a small devotional for us to think about right now as we enter into the third hour prayer. You notice in the morning prayer that a lot of the prayers, a lot of the hymns, talked about really the beginning, the genesis of everything. One of the things that Orthodox Christians are encouraged to do during Great Lent is to read the book of Genesis. Because it's very important for us to, re to really understand what today is about. We have to understand, we have to understand what God intended and what actually happened. We all know the story, we read about this in Genesis 2 and 3, about the creation, about how God created this whole world for us, and the pinnacle of creation being mankind, Adam and Eve. And you see in the prayers, it's talked about on Friday, God created Adam, and on Friday, the children of Adam, I mean, crucified God. You see that constant theme. We know the story. Adam and Eve were in the garden, and the serpent comes and tempts them. Because God told them, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I want us to kind of think about trees today. Don't, he says, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat every other tree, fruit from every other tree. Anything that the earth is producing, you can eat. But this one tree, do not eat from this one tree. And so the serpent comes and, of course, tempts and says, to Eve, you know, God doesn't want you to be like him. And so that's the reason he's telling you not to do that. Playing with pride, right? And so, of course, Eve's, Eve falls, we know that. Adam also falls, partaking of this fruit. And from that point on, God's plan, original plan, was distorted. Death, sin, have entered into the world. And we all are really in the consequence of that, and we live in that. And for all of the Old Testament especially, they've been living in that. So when I teach the kids this story, everybody gets it, right? They okay, this is the story. Then as you get older, questions start to come. Good questions. Maybe questions that we haven't even thought about. But I want us to, I just thought to share some questions. Good question that comes up is, you know, God created all of creation. He created all that was good. Why did God create the serpent? Why did, and we say, well, the ser serpent is the devil. Okay, why did God create the devil? And then we have to get into that and say, well, God didn't create the devil. God created angels. And a certain group of angels, led by Lucifer, as we know, or the devil, revolted against God. In the scriptures it says a third of the angels revolted against God. And in their rebellion, they were cast down. And this is and they're in that state of constant rebellion of God. And they're, they're, their job is to bring all of humanity and all of creation in under, under that state. To join them in that torment. As we say, misery loves company. And so God didn't intend for the serpent or for, the saint, for Satan uh, to be that way. He intended that all the angels would be with him in communion and worship. But he was one who didn't want to do that. He's full of pride. And so the kids get that, right? Okay. So God intended for good. A certain group of angels led by Satan rebelled. And so this is where we have it. He didn't want good and evil. That wasn't his intent. Many people feel like, oh, in order for there to be good, there has to be evil. No, not necessarily. God created the whole world and all of humanity, and it was good. 
move on in Sunday school life? And I, there's a really good question that came, I think maybe this year or last year, but it's a good question. Why did God... Okay, I understand about the serpent and the created angels who rebelled. Okay. But why did God create the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Why did he even put a tree there that could hurt us? Right? Like that we take it and at that time, that we take it and we're away from God. You know, we disappear. Why did he even put that there? If that tree is not there, this whole thing is not an issue. Right? It's true, right? Because God said you can eat everything except this one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So why even? For sure the tree was created by God. And so why would he do that? Why would he put this stipulation? Why would he, even you could say, why would he tempt us? Right? Why would he tempt us? Why would he put that there? The whole, all of this that we talk about, all of this that we suffer through in this world, right? All of this the struggle and the suffering, and the worst suffering, death, which God never intended, right? It's a consequence of our separation from God. Um, and that's why we, we knew that God had to come and reconcile us. We say that word, He reconciled us to Him. And so why? Why that tree? The tree is not there. And when we come to understand what the church fathers say about the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, it's important that the tree is there. It couldn't have been that everything was okay and good. And the reason is this. God wants us to have a loving relationship with Him. That's why He created us. He did not create us to be robots. And so what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents is the choice that we have to turn away from God and the choice to reject that and turn towards God. Let me explain that. If everything was good, and we could partake of everything, then there's no choice, really. Right? Every, I mean, we're just, we're doing, you know, we can understand this with children, right? They stay in our house, and they come with us to church, and they do what we do a lot of times when they're young. And it's all good, but they really also don't have much of a choice. Maybe when a child goes to college, you really know where that person's choices are, right? If they choose to come to church when they're away from our house, and they say, I'm going to go to church, that's a strong, you know that's something deep there. It's no force there. It's not they didn't have any other option. They wanted to go. They wanted to seek the Lord in the church, right? We know that's just a simple example, but there's so many different things we can apply. Studying, same thing, right? When, they, when a child is away and they go to college, if they decide to go to the library, they have the choice. Go to the library or go, uh, go to the movies. They have those choices, right? And you need that choice to develop your character, to know where you stand in life. That's why even as a parent, we do that. When, they, when they're of age, they, it's their life. I, so many seniors say that to me about it their choice, their life, what they want to do, right? They realize that. And that's a loving way to be. And it's a beautiful, meaningful thing when a child decides to make good choices. It brings joy to parents, right? And it's a grieving thing when it's the other way around. And so I say that to say, with God giving us that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, He gave us a choice. Because only in, a, in, in freedom do we experience love. Just like he's giving us choices today, right? So it was very important. And the interesting thing that some of the church fathers say is that tree also was meant to be partaken of later in their relationship with God. Adam and Eve were going to be able to partake of that tree too. It wasn't it was just always going to be there. But they weren't ready for it yet, is what some of the church fathers say, to partake of that fruit. But the real thing is that they chose to disobey God. And in their disobedience, they've turned their face to God. That's how powerful obedience is. And I think it's very important for us to reflect on that, to understand where this all starts and how each and every one of us 
There is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in all of our lives, really. It's not just something that's there in the Garden of Eden, but it really, in every day, we have a choice to obey or to turn from God. And a lot of times we take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're ashamed. What did Adam and Eve do? They took that fruit and they started to hide. And what does God say? Adam, where are you? Right? That's his question to Adam. Where are you? Why are you hiding? It's the same thing. Don't you notice? When we take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in our lives, whatever, choosing against God, choosing against the right, we want to hide. We don't want to show ourselves in the light of the parents or of the authorities or of our friends or of God himself, the light of the world. And so let's meditate on that as we move along in these hours. We're going to start the third hour of prayer. Third hour is at 9 a.m. All of the hours of the day of prayer now have a unique significance. We know that we pray these hours or the church prescribes this to us, but there's a unique significance on each of these hours. The third hour is really meditating on the, the court, the questioning, all the people that are questioning Christ the King. And we'll participate in that at this time. Let's take a moment to meditate, and then we'll start the third hour prayer. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. We just completed the third hour. And as we continue our meditation this day, really if you think about it, the Good Friday is a meditation. These prayers and hymns are there for us to meditate on the passion of our Lord and especially the crucifixion of our Lord. We were talking about the choice that God gives us, the freedom He gives us. It says in the prayer that we read in the Zethro for third hour, Adam in his freedom chose to disobey God. We talked about that at the last hour of prayer. Here we see a dialogue in the gospel between two men, especially you see this person, Pilate. Pilate is one who you can see is really conflicted in his in this situation. He's really not wanting to make this decision. He doesn't want to at all. You can see it. He really doesn't find anything wrong with Jesus, but at the same time, he doesn't seem to have the courage needed to allow Jesus to be free. And so he's trying his best to relieve himself of the choice. He finds out, this man is from Galilee? Oh, maybe someone else can take care of this. Sends him to Herod, who he was not friends with at the time. And Herod, here's another person, who's looking at Jesus not as someone to believe in, but someone to be impressed by. As if Jesus has something to offer, to, has, has, needs to impress us. That's the way Herod looks at it. And so, I bring this up because even in our free will that we have, we can often be like Pilate, where we don't want to make a real strong choice. We don't want to be firm in our decision to follow Christ, to accept His gift of salvation to us. We may want to kind of wash our hands. The, the, the famous scene that we see is Pilate washing his hands, saying, give me some water. Why? I wash my hands and I am innocent. I am innocent of the blood of this man. Here's the interesting part of it. What do we say? As much as we say that Pilate wants to think that he's innocent, what do we say all the time in our prayers? And in the days of Pontius Pilate, he was crucified for us, in the days of Pontius Pilate. It's so ironic that here's a man who washed his hands to say, I have nothing to do with it. But the Christian church since that time has always pointed out his name in the creed to say, it was during your watch. It was during your time that this happened. I say this to say for us to think on this. 
we can't wash our hands of this choice. We can't say we have one foot here and yeah, we like Christ and we, we, especially during Lent and Holy Week, but we also want to be doing what we want to do. We will be held to judgment on that. And it's either good and faithful servant or depart from me, I do not know you. And Pilate here is a man who's struggling to make a decision. And as we look at our freedom and what God has given us, I encourage all of us to, especially during this Holy Week, to think on that and say, am I strong in my decisions to follow Christ and His commandments? Or am I, have I been wavering? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. We hate indecision, even as a society. You know, as many of you are watching on Facebook, you see... The worst thing that we can hear is maybe, right? It asks, are you coming to this event? Yes, no, maybe. Maybe is the worst. Either let it be a yes or let it be a no. And some people can plan. Maybe it's like we don't know what to do with that. And we do that with our spiritual life. It's a maybe spiritual life. And Jesus is saying, I wish you were either hot or cold. This is what he says in Revelation. I wish you were either hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, I just want to spit you up. Be either hot and on fire like the martyrs, like the early church, like our Saint Stephen, or be cold, if that's your decision. But don't waver. Pilate is wavering here in his decisions. Let us learn from that and know that we will be held to account for our life on the decisions that we made with the freedom that God has given us. May our glory be to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and always, forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. Amen. In the sixth hour prayers, as we talk about, we've been talking about choices and God giving us the choice in a relationship of love for Him. What we see is that the creation is looking at our choices and reacting to it. We saw this, we see that it explained how the sun, the sun's light failed. We, we read that and sang that over and over again. The sun's light couldn't shed light seeing the true light on the cross. Darkness went over the earth. I was reading the Syrian book called the Madhe Dono, which is the feast, the Book of Feasts, and it was talking about when that is read in the scripture, when we read it, the sun's light failed, the light should be turned off. To remind ourselves that darkness came over the earth during that time. We talked about Pilate earlier, how Pilate couldn't make a choice in his indecision, he ended up choosing wrong. And we see the, the chief priests and all who've made wrong choices. But we also see someone here who makes the right choice, despite what he's done in his life. He was a thief, the thief on the cross, on the right-hand side, who makes the right choice. And he says, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says the most wonderful words back, Today I say to you, today, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Reminding ourselves of our original home that God created for us. And telling the thief that's where he's going to be. That's the choice that we want to make in our lives. Remember, he's a criminal, this man. But when he came face to face with Jesus, he was able to see him as the Savior, as the Messiah, and accept his offering of salvation. The thief on the left-hand side was not able to do that. He also was a criminal, but he was challenging Jesus. Save yourself. Save us too. You're the, you say you're the Son of God. And the thief on the right-hand side was able to understand and see him for his humility and understand this is how God chose to save us by 
bending low. And throughout our prayers, especially today, we want to identify with the thief on the right hand side. And we want to say the same prayer that the thief says, Remember me, Lord, when you come. We constantly sing that, we constantly will say that. He was able to make the right choice when he was given the opportunity. We are given this opportunity day after day. And the thief on the right hand side is giving a great example of how we are to look at Christ and not make excuses, not justify, not challenge God, but in our weaknesses, in our wrongdoings, to see Him as the Savior and to say to Him, Remember me, Lord, when you come. May all glory be to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and always and forever and ever. Amen. Spirit, one true God, forever and ever. Amen. As we have finished the ninth hour, I started with how this day, this morning, with talking about how God created Adam and Eve to be with Him in paradise and the choices that we have. We saw in the sixth hour, the prayers talk about how creation reacted to the choices of mankind. One of the stanzas I really like is about the tree. We've been talking about trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life. And there's a tree of the cross and it says, the tree said, woe is me, that I am, that the Lord is being crucified on me. Because all the Lord did was nurture me, take care of me, send me sun, send me rain. And this is how I'm repaying Him. I'm being used to repay Him. And it's the same thing that we can think of in our lives when we make choices against Christ. All He has done is given us life and all the blessings that we see around us. And the creation is reminding us of that. I think one of the biggest things that we choose to do is we worship the creation instead of worshiping the Creator. But we see here today, it's the creation that worships Christ Himself. When He's hung on the cross, the sun hid. The oceans were moved, it says in the, in the, in the prayers. Seeing the ocean of mercy stopped. All of these things that we see. One thing I want us to keep in mind is that we're given this free will and I feel like what's happening in society nowadays is that we're being told that we're not important, that we were just created out of nothing in a big bang, or that we just evolved from animals. And man is kind of, we're losing and forgetting the fact that we were created in the image and likeness of God that we were created with a purpose. We're forgetting, no one is being reminded that, no one's being told that. And that's an important thing to know. I think if there's anything that we can look at when we see the cross, is that you matter to God. Each and every one of us matter to God. We live in a society full of despair. And everybody is not wanting to live and maybe not feeling worth. I think if anything, when we wear the cross, when we sign the cross, when we bear the cross, especially as we are entering into the veneration of the cross, the one thing I hope you see when you look at a cross is you matter. That God loves you that He died for you, that you're not just come into being without purpose, but you are in the image and likeness of God, God's love for mankind. Sometimes we wonder, why did God choose to do it this way? He could have chosen maybe many things He could have done. He could have wiped out all of humanity, started fresh, started over. He could have just said, forget about it, this was not a good idea. But in His love, 
He gives us a chance back to life. He gives us a chance back to the Garden of Eden through the Holy Church. And so we always have a choice when we look at the cross. Do I want to eat of this fruit that's being offered? The Church Fathers tell us the new tree of life is being offered to us. Because we read in the Genesis account, the tree of life, there was an angel, a cherubim with a sword, going back and forth, preventing anybody to partake of it. But the Church teaches us the cross is the tree of life, and the true fruit of the cross is the body and blood which is given to us. And so we have a choice every day to understand that, to be reminded of that. I hope when you see the cross, you take it very personal. It's not just a symbol of Christian faith, but it's a very personal thing. We want to be able to say, like St. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is not me who lives, but Christ who lives in me. This is what we want to be able to say. And I hope that as we approach this service of the cross, which the world considers foolish, St. Paul talks about this in his letter to the Corinthians, the world will look at the cross and say that it's a foolish thing. And we see that every day in our society. That's not something strange. But St. Paul says, for those who believe, it is salvation. And so we claim that today as we approach this veneration of the cross service. At this time, we'll have some time for meditation and scripture reading as we prepare for the veneration of the cross service.